welcome everyone. We're just getting people in out of the waiting room here for a minute, if you can bear with us. All right, so welcome to our research seminar for the School of Public Health. I'm Jen Ahern, Associate Dean for Research. Um, and for those who are uh, students enrolled for credit, um, Lauren will put the sign-in sheet in the chat uh, shortly. So remember to go in there and uh, let us know if you are in fact here. Um, and as I stall a little bit for everyone to get connected, um, I will introduce our speaker. So I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Andrew Kim. Um, Andrew will be talking about uh, psychological legacies of intergenerational trauma under South Africa apartheid. Um, Dr. Kim is a professor in our um, anthropology department. Um, but as you will see, um, there are a lot of connections with health uh, throughout his work. Um, and it's really exciting to have him uh, bringing a kind of cross-departmental talk over to us in public health. So we really appreciate this, Andrew, and we're really looking forward to it. So please take it away. Hey, cool. Thanks so much. Um, as Jenna mentioned, my name is Andy Kim. I'm an assistant professor of biological anthropology um, at, here at Berkeley and also an honorary researcher at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, been working in South Africa for quite some time now, um, since before I started my dissertation to, to now. Um, it's my second year here at Cal, and I'm excited to um, officially engage with um, you all here in public health school. All right, so in 1994, some of you likely witnessed South Africa overcoming its nearly 50-year history of violent white supremacist rule under the colonial apartheid regime which was won through a long, hard-fought movement for decolonization. And during this time, the hopes and aspirations for feelings of unity, equality, and freedom were, in, were palpable in what was known as the Rainbow Nation. Um, and the country witnessed an exciting transition into a, ne a new, quote, free South Africa. Um, but since the country's democratic transition, um, the promises of apartheid, our post-apartheid freedom and nationalist ideologies promoting these fallacious neoliberal narratives of multiculturalism and racial equity have continuously been met with um, criticities of anti-Black violence, misogynoir, and extreme class inequality, all of which highlight the lasting legacies of apartheid continuing to recapitulate into the present day. So South Africa is a country that's popularly characterized by abhorrent racial, geographic, and socioeconomic inequalities. And these compounding conditions of past and present day social adversity have created fertile ground for the production of a suite of social problems, um, uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, joblessness. Um, and all these problems fall along race, class, gender, um, and geographic lines. But in addition to ongoing poverty and unemployment, um, South Africa continues to experience uh, multiple interacting disease epidemics, um, uh, altogether characterized as a quadruple burden of disease, um, which is a, um, a, a description of um, these multiple disease in, um, in, interacting disease epidemics um, that was first coined in South Africa. And this is um, a combination of the rising wave of cardiometabolic diseases, um, infectious diseases like HIV and TB in South Africa, um, violence and mental health concerns, which I'll talk about later today, and uh, maternal and infant um, morbidity and mortality. Now today, South African society continues to be plagued by the persistent societal institutions of apartheid, including chronic poverty, discrimination, and racialized inequality, all of which are known risk factors for physical and mental illness across the life course. So the ongoing social transformations away from the apartheid past and the rapidly escalating public health burden um, of disease and illness into the future raise um, key questions for anthropology, epidemiology, and the health of transitioning societies. And all these questions guide my um, current research. 
First, how do traumas experienced by past generations affect the health and well-being of current and future generations who weren't directly exposed to the traumas of apartheid? Two, what are the underlying mechanisms of intergenerational trauma um, that affect human development and disease risk? And three, what can be done to undo these effect and um, these effects of intergenerational trauma and promote generational healing? So um, South African apartheid has widely been conceptualized as a historical trauma, which is defined as the collective and cumulative experiences of trauma and its equali that harm uh, oppressed communities across generations. Um, we This has become very much a buzzword um, in today's um, media and um, world of public health and psychology. Um, and historical trauma has become um, synonymous with the term of intergenerational trauma, which um, here I'm going to distinguish as uh, specific mechanisms of trauma transmission that manifest across two generations. So this um, uh, is, uh, differs from the broader definition of historical trauma, which describes the overarching condition and phenomena of trauma sequelae on a societal level. Um, the events of condi and conditions of historical trauma um, are oftentimes extreme in nature, based on the magnitude, duration, and meaning of the trauma, and can uh, include a series of events and conditions to make up the overall experience of historical trauma in a particular society. Scholarly and political concerns of historical trauma have particularly focused on the struggles of post-colonial societies to understand ongoing consequences of colonization and to also allow survivors of colonization to seek retribution from colonial institutions and heal. And historical trauma of apartheid is considered an ever-present problem in um, South African society, which continuously grapples with uh, these widespread legacies. And finally, the growing body of research in public health and biological anthropology, along with other disciplines, suggests that the overall state of disease morbidity in oppressed communities may partially be shaped by the long-term effects of historical trauma. Oops, sorry. So historical trauma can manifest in a variety of ways, and we've known a lot more about the societal, political, and interpersonal dynamics of um, intergenerational, or sorry, historical trauma, um, rather than the um, developmental and biological mechanisms, which is what I'll be talking about later today. So in terms of social and political processes, you include things like political effects of genocide, cultural erasure, um, loss of collective, collective identity and disempowerment. So here I think about um, residential boarding schools in North America um, affecting indigenous communities um, and also operating on interpersonal levels. So um, dy dynamics that go on within the household or across families. So um, conditions of domestic violence, learn negative coping behaviors such as substance abuse, um, poor emotional dysregulation or regulation and um, conditions of family dysfunction. Now, in the past two decades, scientists have uncovered the possibility that human physiological mechanisms may underlie the transmission of stress and trauma across generations. And major recent scientific breakthroughs have shed light on the possibility that the effects of trauma may be intergenerationally transmissible through various biological mechanisms. So this can include nutritional um, mechanisms, hormonal and epigenetic processes. So some of these um, major case studies that have come out that many of you all may be familiar with include the epigenetic inheritance of maternal care in rats, um, the work of Michael Meade and colleagues, um, as well as a consonance of biological and psychiatric trauma phenotypes between Holocaust survivors um, and their um, quote unexposed children or those who weren't exposed to horror, directly exposed to the horrors of the Holocaust. Um, I also think about um, the Dutch hunger winter study um, showing the long-term impacts of famine during in utero development um, and impacts across multiple generations. So while the study of intergenerational trauma highlights new scientific understandings of the interactions between biology and culture, evidence on intergenerational trauma also represents um, opportunities for seeking justice and retribution for affected communities. So identifying the lasting impacts of previous political massacres allows communities afflicted by historical trauma to advocate for greater resources, justify reparative action, and heal um, psychic wounds. But without the knowledge, language, and evidence or rhetorical tools to communicate the complexities of how past events could continue to affect the present, communities are faced to prove their suffering in order to make a quote convincing claim um, to authority figures. So I also think about the case of um, for example, um, people who are having to um, uh, 
justify the the suffering or trauma that they experience during sexual assault cases on university campuses or, or elsewhere. Some communities have reclaimed scientific evidence for intergenerational trauma. Um, so Native American, Australian Aboriginal, and African and African diasporic groups have used scientific studies of intergenerational stress transmission to push for reparative action and redistributive justice in their respective communities. So here on the left is um, a court case that was presented in front of the International Criminal Court by civilian survivors of the Bogota massacre in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And these civilian survivors had cited evidence um, on the intergenerational effects of trauma affecting both mother-child attachment behaviors, but also child cortisol levels um, in the second generation in a case for reparations in front of the ICC. Um, unfortunately, their um, case was uh, this evidence was considered unconvincing, and this case ultimately was denied uh, due to the fact, partially due to the fact that um, this evidence um, wasn't substantive enough um, for the court. Um, and here on the right, um, I show um, an Instagram um, post actually that um, I came across while I was just trying to live my best life and not think about work, but then all of a sudden I see this post about intergenerational trauma. Um, people, um, uh, or I guess descendants of um, uh, ancestors who would experience political traumas coming from European war, um, slavery and racial violence, as well as um, uh, South Asian partition. Um, and I'm not going to comment on the scientific validity of the, this post because um, I think what this post is actually trying to do is talk about, um, you know, the the larger social and political meanings that um, the that the, the scientific evidence on intergenerational trauma may mean for people in this generation and in the future generations. So issues of PTSD, domestic violence, low self-esteem, complex PTSD, potentially impacting um, future generations. So all this to say the stakes of the scientific research on intergenerational trauma um, are quite pressing. Now, given the rapid pace at which scientific knowledge about the bio biology of intergenerational trauma is moving, as well as the political and ethical implications of such biosocial research, in addition to um, important scientific studies, we must take pause to critically reflect on how scientific knowledge about intergenerational trauma is produced and its potential social implications. So here I think about um, several possibilities, such as one, the possible reification of ideas of biological and genetic-based race, to a reduction of historical violence and social experience through biological data, and the perpetuation of eugenic ideology and scientific racism in disciplines like biological anthropology, which were very much part of the production of um, eugenics in America, as well as um, human scientific research, um, whereby research may be directly perpetuating these racial stereotypes about disease and inferiority. And finally, uh, addressing these issues of historical trauma, reparations, and collective healing are essential to allowing historically marginalized communities create healthy and thriving societies on their own terms. Here we are. So to address my current research question, I'll first um, provide some context about uh, mental health in South Africa. I'll then um, introduce my theoretical framework, which comes from the developmental origins of um, health and disease framework. Um, then I'll be speaking about the fieldwork that I conducted in South Africa and then draw some conclusions. So um, South Africa has one of the highest rates of psychiatric disease prevalence in the sub-Saharan continent. Um, approximately one in three individuals are estimated to experience some um, DSM-4 classified psychiatric order disorder sometime in their life or approximately 33% uh, lifetime prevalence. Um, and um, individuals in the public health care sector or who use um, the public health care sector for psychiatric disease or, or for psychiatric treatment um, face a 92% treatment gap, um, which means that only eight out of 100 individuals who actually need psychiatric um, treatment receive it. So this is a you know, huge disparity. Um, All together, these statistics show that um, the national burden of mental illness um, is met with low rates of healthcare access and utilization, as well as heavy burdens of stigma against mental health, um, and um, suggests a larger um, concerning state of mental health care, uh, mental health and mental health care in South Africa. So we've known for a long time that social experience and um, environments can become embodied and shape mental health. But newer frameworks suggest that there can be larger effects, possibly larger effects, if stress and trauma are experienced earlier. 
So in addition to the ongoing societal adversity and trauma, there's growing evidence that the stressors of the past could have lingering biological effects that can continue to shape mental health in the present um, and later in one's life. So it's well known that past experiences of childhood trauma are significant risk factors for poor future health across life course, across the life course into adulthood for both um, psychiatric and increasingly physical um, health outcomes. So a wide range of researchers in developmental science and biological anthropology have become interested in this phenomenon of the durable effects of early life stress. Um, and some of the um, uh, some of the key seminal work actually on this re uh, research has actually um, been done by um, Lauren Goldstein and her, uh, her group in the past um, during um, her training. So many thanks to Lauren for this work. And over time, um, these researchers um, have used and contributed to what is known as the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease Framework, also known as DOHAD, to understand how early life conditions affect biological systems to shape future health outcomes across the life course. And growing research in this field has traced possible biological mechanisms that explain how embodied traumas from the past can manifest somatically over time to produce disease. So fairly recent evidence has also suggested that long-term psychiatric effects of early life trauma may be shaped by exposures that actually precede early postnatal development in the child going as far back as fetal development. Past stress and trauma, particularly those that occur during early life, can durably and also adversely affect the development and function of various stress physiological mechanisms. Um, these include the immune system, glucose metabolism, cardiovascular function, and neurobiological pathways. So maternal prenatal stress um, or um, maternal stress that's experienced during gestation or pregnancy is a well-known risk factor that's been consistently associated with a, a wide array of birth, poor birth outcomes. So mechanistically, maternal stress has been hypothesized to impact fetal development and subsequent birth outcomes um, through the intergenerational transfer of maternal cortisol and inflammatory cytokines um, or inflammation to the developing fetus. Increased levels of stress leading to increased levels of um, circulating cortisol, um, which is known to pass across the placenta and may also lead to altered um, regulation of um, immune function, leading to greater levels of inflammatory cytokines that also pass through the placental wall. Um, so both um, increased cortisol and cytokine transfer that um, crosses through the placenta to reach the developing fetus is hypothesized to um, alter um, the trajectory, the developmental trajectory of the fetus um, during development and um, postnatally, um, uh, uh, predicting things such as lo uh, lower infant body size, sort of gestations, and restricted fetal growth rates. Um, and being born small or preterm is a major risk factor for um, a wide range of um, future adult diseases. Human clinical studies have recently shown that adults whose mothers reported greater levels of prenatal stress exhibited elevated basal cortisol levels and HPA axis activation after undergoing a laboratory stressor. So here on the left, we see um, a diagram, x-axis is time, y-axis is salivary cortisol levels. Um, and um, we see two different groups. The circles are low birth weight individual, those who were born low birth weight um, and um, triangles representing high birth weight. Um, and these individuals were exposed to a laboratory stressor known as the um, Trier Social Stress Test, which is essentially this um, artificial stressor where um, they have participants stand in front of a group of Confederates, um, and um, the Confederates are trained to, or ask the participant to give a speech about their future, like their future and their goals, and then also do some like stupid mental math. And it's supposed to elicit this um, very stressful response of social evaluation. Um, and the Confederates are trained to make absolutely no reaction to people's faces. If anything, they um, are um, also trained to give very disapproving looks to the participants. Um, and this is known to elicit a cortisol reaction or a stress response. And of course, um, through the IRB process, we know that this is called deception. Um, of course, they are then told that they're undergoing, you know, this are part of the experiments and debriefed, um, but we see differences in HP access um, activation as a result of this artificial stress based on birth weight. In the second study, researchers illustrated that these lasting effects of childhood trauma on HPA axis 
um, on the adult HP axis closely reflect key neuroendo neuroendocrine features of depression. Similarly, researchers have documented that adults whose mothers experienced maternal depression during pregnancy gave birth to children with elevated C-reactive protein, which is a marker for systemic inflammation at 25 years of age in the second generation. So here we see on the x-axis increasing levels of both prenatal and childhood adversity, and the y-axis um, is a log transform um, measure of CRP. So we see direct relationships um, that are significant. And on the right, we see from another study that scientists have found that childhood sexual abuse predicts greater inflammation levels in adult children as their depression severity increases. So thus far, scientists have found that the long-term impacts of prenatal stress may be one pathway that intergenerational trauma can elevate later life mental illness risk. And specifically, the, early, um, the effects of early developmental stress may lead to the production of a vulnerable phenotype um, that causes harmful modulation of um, neurotransmission, altered neuronal development and function, and even neuronal death. Um, and we also see a possible pathway of increased um, sensitivity to future stress. Um, so this is um, through a behavioral mechanism that's um, postulated to have a psychobiological um, Cross underlying process. And this increased sensitivity to future stress in turn may increase um, an individual's risk for developing um, a psychiatric episode and thus um, increasing the risk for developing a range of mental illnesses across their life. So in summary, new scientific evidence suggests that um, the embodied effects of trauma and violence from the past may reverberate intergenerationally and have specific or have similar impacts in children, even though they weren't directly exposed to traumas of the past. So based on the recent literature and um, on the lasting physio physiological impacts of prenatal stress, we know so far that in situations of heightened environmental and psychosocial stress, on average, pregnant mothers secrete greater levels of circulating immunological markers and stress hormones like cortisol, which can pass across the placental wall and reach the developing fetus. Along with the experiences of postnatal early life stress, these two sensitive periods for HPA axis development have increasingly been associated with altered activity at multiple points across child development, infancy, early childhood, adolescence, later childhood, and more recently during adulthood. But what happens when these accumulated embodied impacts of stress reach, reach women at reproductive age? Here I present my conceptual model that explains how maternal trauma exposure may transmit intergenerationally to affect uh, physical and mental health across a life course and the next generation, and in turn alter the intrauterine environment of the next generation. The schematic shows how this may happen. Here I show the potential multi-generational effects of stress transmission that manifest in the grandmother's experience, um, to the, her future grandchildren. Maternal stress-induced elevations in stress physiological function can an, um, enter the maternal circulation and in turn penetrate the placental wall and reach the gestational environment of future offspring, thereby, thereby impacting the development of fetal stress physiology. Early life stress linked to dysregulation of stress physiological mechanisms has have consistently been linked uh, been um, reported, sorry, as a prospective risk factor and cross-sectional neuropsychiatric phenotype of a range of psychiatric illnesses, including depression, psychosis, suicidal ideation, and schizophrenia all across the lifespan. So to date, no study has assessed grand maternal and utero stress and its multidirectional impacts on their children and grandchildren and humans, and in particular using a prospective design. Um, and additionally, the gener generalizability of early life stress in mental health studies is limited by the lack of diverse study samples, partic particularly those located in um, the global south, where the burden of mental illness is the highest. So thus I set out to test this model to examine how does um, prenatal stress during apartheid shape the physical and mental health outcomes in subsequent generations. So one place that's been particularly um, impacted by this issue um, are the townships in South Africa, which were central sites of political divestment and violence during the apartheid regime. And one township that was deeply affected by apartheid violence, especially the dissolution of the colonial government was in Soweto. So Soweto is um, a portmanteau for Southwestern townships, and it's located Southwest of the city of Johannesburg, as you can see here. 
Soweto began as an amalgamation of separate townships in the southwest region, region of Joburg. And after the discovery of gold in Joburg in the mid-19th century, um, the Dutch Afrikaans-led, quote, South African Republic settled around Johannesburg and created new manufacturing industries. And over time, working class communities across all, quote, racial groups or um, these like social technologies that were developed, or technological groups that developed to um, define racial groups in South Africa, um, settled in the area until population management laws resegregated South African communities, which is when the concept of the township um, became popularized. Black communities emerged in various townships that made up Soweto, but the history of social life in the years preceding apartheid up until decolonization included increasing cases of government divestment, informal settlements, mass migration, growing unplanned urbanization, and also deep political organizing and resistance against state violence. Soweto was eventually resegregated again geographically, but this time by various African ethnic groups. These include um, Sutu, Tswana, Tsonga, Venda, Zulu, Mosa, and others. And today, so uh, Soweto is a lively, bustling urban center, still affected by post-apartheid legacies, but also a site of social mobility and rich cultural life. And like many other lower income um, urban centers in South Africa, um, things like poverty, unemployment, and inter-ethnic uh, violence driven by economic competition and poor um, provisioning of poor, um, public resources have produced every, um, elevated levels of everyday violence, mental distress, and trauma-related illnesses in Soweto. And one recent estimate found that up to 55% of individuals were considered to be at high risk for developing a psychiatric disorder, uh, which was largely driven by ambient stress, violence, and um, socioeconomic insecurity. So I draw from um, data uh, on a study that I um, work in collaboration with um, uh, with my colleagues in uh, the Developmental Pathways for Health Research Unit um, at the University of the Watersrun in Johannesburg. Um, and the study is known as Birth of 20 or uh, Mandela's Children. Um, Birth of 20 um, has now recently been named Birth of 30, given the fact that participants in the study recently turned 30 years old. Um, but for the rest of the presentation, I'll call it Birth of 20 because that's um, it was still Birth of 20 um, when these data were collected. So Birth of 20 is the largest and longest running study of child health in the continent um, and is uh, initial, was initially designed to assess the impacts of societal change that was going on during apartheid, particularly these um, shifting um, conditions of urbanization and resegregation. Um, Birth of 20 started out as um, a sample that was multiracial and multi uh, as multiracial and um, in an attempt to represent um, the characteristics of the larger area, um, Johannesburg and Soweto. But over time, um, I think after yeah, 10 years of the study, the, um, the study planners decided to um, focus in um, on um, Black South African individuals, given the fact that um, the study was based in um, Soweto and um, were part particularly serving Black South African communities. Um, and this is the only longitudinal study to examine the impacts of prenatal stress during apartheid, um, and also um, among uh, the very small handful of prospective birth cohort studies um, in the continent. So in order to examine this question, I evaluated the impacts of maternal prenatal stress during apartheid across multiple stages um, and across the child's life course. First, assessing the effects of maternal prenatal stress in utero or on in utero development, and again, during later adolescence. So I'll be presenting data from these three studies. So first, to begin to understand the intergenerational effects of trauma, I first sought out to examine how maternal prenatal stress affected um, child health and development during the earliest period of life during fetal development. And in this first study, I hypothesized that greater levels of prenatal stress will predict lower birth weights. So this study um, used a 16 item measure of prenatal stress that was developed using qualitative research um, from social life in the townships. Um, and particularly in Soweto, um, and um, identified four separate domains, um, marital, familial, societal, social, and economic stress. Um, and um, when um, infants were born, um, uh, different birth characteristics were um, collected, things like birth weight, gestational age, um, and this analysis um, also adjusted for a variety of different relevant covariates. 
And I wanted to focus in a little bit about um, the prenatal stress assessment um, here, which is a primary exposure variable for all these um, uh, studies. Um, so it um, um, draws from a collection of different um, types of experiences, you know, highlighted here, as I mentioned, economic, marital, familial, and societal stress. Um, and here is a quote um, that I uh, got from an interview with a birth of 20 participant that was um, uh, that was pregnant during um, the time of data collection. Um, I won't go into the quote right now for the lack, for lack of time, um, but just highlighting the various different dimensions of discrimination and societal stress um, that um, particularly Black women and women of color were facing during this time. So after running our regression models, we find no relationship between prenatal stress and birth weight. Um, we then stratified our sample um, by um, assigned sex, and we find that women who reported worse experiences um, of uh, stress and trauma during apartheid, on average, gave birth to lower birth weight babies, only among infant girls. Um, and it's important to, um, sorry, I forgot to mention this, but um, strata, we decided to stratify um, based on biological sex, given that boys tend to weigh heavier than girls at birth. Um, and together, these um, data show that um, uh, are an early indication of the earliest signs of intergenerational trauma transmission from the mother to the child through the lowering of infant birth weight. So now that we have early evidence for the intergenerational trauma for um, intergenerational trauma transmission, I then wanted to see how far into the life course do these embodied effects manifest. So in the second analysis, I sought to examine whether maternal prenatal stress exposure predicted worse psychiatric outcomes in the next generation 17 years later, when birth of 20 children were in later adolescence, early adulthood. So they came back between the ages of 17 and 18. And I also um, assessed uh, the potential capacity for these long-term effects of prenatal stress to be buffered or protected against um, through stress attenuating resources like social support, um, and also um, um, exacerbated by assessing um, potential moderating effects uh, through um, uh, maternal age and um, greater levels of ambient stress. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit more in, this, um, in the coming slides. Um, so the, th and the third main aim of this analysis was to evaluate whether prenatal stress may sensitize future reactions to adversity and increase psychiatric morbidity. Um, this is a process I described before um, known as um, stress sensitization. So in this analysis, we had complete data on 304 mother adolescent pairs in birth of 20. Um, main exposure variable was um, the 16 item question of maternal stress that was collected during the third trimester. And participants came back um, at 2007 um, when um, the index generation was 17 years old um, and participated in a variety of different surveys, one being um, a psychiatric assessment, um, the GHQ28 general health questionnaire. Um, and uh, we, we also assessed a variety of different risk and buffering factors, as I mentioned. So in this analysis, um, there was no direct association between maternal prenatal stress and greater psychiatric morbidity later in life. And we also found no significant moderating effects of um, prenatal social support and buffering this association. Um, but after ass assessing the potential role of um, recent stress as a, a proxy measure to assess a stress sensation hypothesis, we found that um, greater levels of prenatal stress um, corresponded with greater levels of adolescent psychiatric risk, um, and this was stronger among individuals who had, or among individuals who had a greater levels um, of concurrent stress um, at age 17. So here from blue to green, we see um, that the association for prenatal, st prenatal stress and psychiatric morbidity increasing. Um, and we also assessed the um, potential risk factor of lower maternal age. Um, this was a really interesting finding, um, which came directly from the ethnographic research that I conducted with um, participants at the time who described a lot of discrimination and stigma um, for having um, a child um, as a teenager at younger ages. Um, this is discrimination that was these younger women had faced not only from their family, but also from the community members and even nurses. And here we see that um, the association between prenatal stress and psychiatric morbidity um, is stronger among individuals who gave birth, um, who, who were 
born to younger um, to younger mothers. So and finally, we wanted to um, try to see a potential underlying biological mechanism by which prenatal stress may um, affect adolescent psychiatric risk later in life. So in a healthy individual, we know that stress-induced secretions of um, cortisol down-regulates in inflammation in the body. So there's this immunoregulatory effect of cortisol on inflammation. Uh, and, this is, and so this explains why when we're, um, we're more prone to getting sick when we're stressed. However, in cases of acute or chronic stress, this immunoregulatory effect of cortisol becomes weaker due to reduced sensitivity of receptors on the immune cells that bind to cortisol, um, leading to elevated levels of circulating inflammatory cytokines in the body. So this, this is sort of this disruption um, in the downregulatory effects of cortisol. And this process may worsen with greater exposure to chronic stress, producing a state known as glucocorticoid resistance. So in this sample, while we didn't have cortisol data at this time point, we also wanted to assess the role of prenatal stress in shaping psychiatric risk, um, partly as a result of immune dysregulation. Oops, sorry. So um, dried blood spots were collected and um, we extracted C-reactive protein from these blood samples. And we found um, a significant moderating effect of CRP um, and this is a relationship. So we see that the effect of prenatal stress on late adolescent psychiatric risk is stronger as inflammatory levels increase. So in sum, we find that the embodied impacts of trauma from apartheid may predict poor adolescent psychiatric risk 17 years later among those with greater concurrent stress and younger maternal age. And together these um, uh, data show that we may, um, that there may be um, longer term, that there may be intergenerational effects affecting individuals at, um, at birth, but also at adolescence, and that there may be an underlying biological mechanism by which this um, stress may be transmitted across generations. So thus far, um, the study of um, the long-term impacts of prenatal stress on mental health across a life course um, is um, still relatively new, but burgeoning. Um, and of course, these studies are limited by the fact that um, uh, prospective studies are expensive and, and hard to organize. Um, but as time goes on, we see more and more um, associations that push um, the, the um, uh, association between prenatal stress and adult um, psychiatric morbidity further into the life, um, out into the life course. Um, so these are just studies that I, um, um, the most recent studies um, that have been conducted among individuals um, across um, adulthood and the next generation. And we see that we tend to see um, uh, positive associations between prenatal stress and worse psychiatric risk in the um, next generation up until 16, 18, 21, and 25. But as we go later into the life course, um, we see fewer numbers of studies. This is not to say that these effects are not do not exist or, or wash out. There's just a small number of studies, so we can't really generalize. Um, but um, but based on the current evidence, we see that um, the uh, the, um, the effects of prenatal stress on um, adult psychiatric risk in the next generation going as far into the life course as 25 years old. So we also wanted to test how far um, these effects manifested into the life course um, with our study. So in this last analysis, um, using um, sample of 458 mother-child pairs. Um, these are adult children at this point at, who are 28 years old. Um, we assessed um, similar um, associations between prenatal stress and adult psychiatric morbidity using the SRQ20. Um, and here we find early evidence for a direct relationship between prenatal stress and adult psychiatric morbidity at 28. Um, I was quite shocked to find this result as I um, expected, honestly, these effects to wash out over 28 years of existence. Um, but um, after controlling for a variety of different um, variables across the life course, um, especially during um, prenatal development and at 28, um, we see um, a modest but significant association between stress and adult psychiatric morbidity. So in sum, we see that prenatal stress may have life force effects across various points um, in the next generation's life. Uh, we see associations, possible associations between inflammation and psychiatric risk, um, and that there may be um, a uh, role of glucocorticoid dysregulation 
um, producing um, greater psychiatric outcomes in the next generation. So in future work, I'm interested in seeing um, whether these effects manifest into the third generations, affecting birth outcomes and early childhood outcomes, and also to test this um, glucocorticoid corticoid resistance hypothesis. Um, and additionally, I'm most interested in trying to understand these processes of reversibility or amelioration. So um, uh, what are some uh, different pathways or resources that can be utilized to um, mitigate the long-term impacts of prenatal stress into the next generation um, and encourage um, long-term positive intergenerational health. So I've conducted this uh, follow-up study in um, the next um, in the second and third generation, um, looking at a, about 187 mother-child pairs. Um, the study was um, conducted during the middle of the pandemic, uh, actually right before the pandemic started, and then we had to start and stop. So unfortunately, these data um, or uh, the processing of the, these data have been delayed. Uh, but this is but these these. Um, my like future work will examine the extent to which prenatal stress affects individuals into the third generation um, and also test possible biological mechanisms looking at um, cortisol and immune dysregulation. This is just a schedule of um, the different um, measures that we collected during this time, a variety of surveys, um, biological assessments, as well as a gold standard um, assessment of salivary cortisol collected across five days, as well as um, multiple daily diary measures um, at, in each of those days. And hopefully I'll be able to come back and give you some of those results, um, but you know, fingers crossed. So while preliminary, these data suggest that the effects of apartheid may continue to live in through the body and raise the possibility that lingering effects of intergenerational trauma can operate on timescales longer than expected. These extended timeframes conflict with nationalist ideologies of the democratic South Africa, which attempted to absolve the sins of apartheid through the Truth and Reconciliation Council in 1996 in an effort to fully transition to freedom and reconciliation, a process that scholars and communities have widely criticized. Subsequently, scholars have highlighted the deafening silence on discussions of the legacies of apartheid, a complex issue motivated by psychological effects of trauma, but also an intentional process of colonialism to maintain racial capitalist structures in South Africa. I also wonder how such empirical evidence could be used to highlight the ongoing effects of historical trauma and bring new meaning into old debates. Additionally, the risk of reifying reductionist racial thinking is high in this work. STS scholar Maurizio Maloney describes a typological interpretation of causes and impacts of environmental exposures, which often map onto socially defined concepts of race and ethnicity and may reify racial determin deterministic explanations of disparities. So here I worry about the incorrect circulation of thoughts on trauma sequelae and its biological impacts as quote fixed effects, or in other words, my biology is my destiny. Um, and many risks and opportunities, there are many risks and opportunities that we must unpack when biological data are used to inform biosocial problems. These concerns motivate us as biological anthropologists to develop a more rigorous consideration of how people have forever been situated in dynamically changing contexts of history, culture, and politics. Elucidating this intergenerational biocultural pathway can help us chart new ways that racial health disparities manifest across generations, specifically operating through means of non-genetic inheritance, developmental change, and the embodiment of social oppression. While the political and economic legacies of apartheid are well known, the biological manifestations of embodied trauma, structural violence, and racial capitalism may operate on separate temporal scales and have distinct racialized, gendered, and class consequences. Here I show the work of Mohao Murisa King, an artist interested in interrogating the excavation of the body in the part in, uh, of apartheid in the body and the release of embodied traumas. So Mohao was actually um, uh, grew up in Soweto next to um, various coal mines, um, and a lot of, in, in this particular piece is talking about um, what it means to um, release himself of these embodied traumas from living next to coal mines and. Um, uh, and also the embodied legacies of apartheid. And here he describes, quote, in my art, the significance of growing up in Soweto is, a, is dealt with from a biographical standpoint. I'm referring to memories from my childhood that somehow highlight what was happening in South Africa. In conclusion, 
these biocultural insights into how historical trauma produces health and well-being today and into the future may ultimately contribute to strengthening the public health of historically oppressed communities that continue to face the consequences of the legacies of apartheid and anti-Black racism seen across the world. Few studies have evaluated the intergenerational biological and mental health impacts of apartheid, and it's my hope that through this research, we build a stronger system to undo the historical legacies of structural violence and continue to understand these long-term impacts um, and continue to understand how these long-term impacts can help con continue to hold the systems of violence and racism accountable for future generations. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Andy, for that great presentation. The work is really, really powerful. We really appreciate you sharing your work with us. Um, I know we have a few minutes for questions. I see that Rosie asked um, whether the prenatal stress measure was a composite score. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we had um, 16 different items um, um, and um, just sum them uh, based on the availability, the bits and the presence or absence of each of these stress, um, these stressors, um, separated them also by um, different domains, which are data that I didn't show um, in this presentation. Um, and um, factor analyses have not really um, brought up anything. Um, we, we assume that they might be grouped based on um, different experiences of stress or the forms of stress, but it seems like this is a one-dimensional um, or, or single-factor um, uh, survey. Any other questions people want to ask? I'm sure you could also reach out um, to Professor Kim um, separately if you have questions that come up later. Um, did you also have cortisol measures in the women prenatally? No, we didn't. Okay. Um, that was okay. the main question that um, I got by uh, NIH reviewers. And unfortunately, we can't go back in time to collect right, right. Um We thought that uh, having prospective measures of stress during third trimester would be good enough, but maybe not. Um, but ideally, we would have, bio we would have biological measures of um, stress exposure at this time point. Um, but hopefully, we can do the same for um, the next generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're just about, so much. Uh, out of time. So thank you so much. And everybody, thanks for joining. Hope you have a good day. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.